Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special edition of The Deadly Experiment with Rick Adams, your host and producer. This is the month, it's the time of the year that this program may be aired on public access television, that we consider the murder, the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States in this year that we look back, 2017 to 18 now, and uh, since 1963, when I was a little child in a little classroom in Providence, Rhode Island. And we remember the Kennedy assassination uh, as we saw it unfold on nationwide television. We didn't know at the time then, and we didn't know even later, even now, fully, anything that actually happened in Dallas, Texas on that fateful day. But we know that there was a conspiracy to kill the president. That we know because there was a cover-up commission to prove otherwise. It was known as the Warren Commission. And all of the bigwigs who were on the Warren Commission happened to be very impressive and important people who were connected to the corruption of Dallas in 1963. The CIA, the Council on Foreign Relations, and a host of other insiders from the Arlen Specter camp of the Philadelphia mob, which is the Kosha Nostra, that is the Yiddish mob. So we are going to prepare you for this special program, which may continue and may go on to two programs of my radio program that I did on Republic Broadcasting System, or network, in 2011, because it has the late, great Michael Collins Piper on the program, who authored the book, which is all over the internet, The Final Judgment. The Final Judgment was his definitive work on tracing the links of the Kennedy assassination to Jerusalem, to La Cosha Nostra and Ben-Gurion in Israel. Very fascinating and very frightening look at the final judgment on John Fitzgerald Kennedy and the people, the very powerful people he offended. John Kennedy threatened after the Bay of Pigs fiasco to carve up the CIA, to literally smash it to pieces, as he was quoted as having said. Well, apparently, it was he who was blown to pieces because of his threat to do which that which no president has ever been able to do, not even little Humpty Dumpty Donald Trump, because the CIA is the mafia. It is La Cosha Nostra. It is, as we have shown on other programs, totally corrupt from top to bottom. It was formed out of the remnants of the old OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, in World War II. And it just so happens that two of the founding members, the creators of the Central Intelligence Agency, happened to be communists, Soviet agents of the tribe. Just so happened of the three. So what we have is a corrupt agency of government totally and completely owned by powerful deep state inside forces that now you've been hearing about more and more as time goes on. It's all coming out, interestingly enough, under the Trump administration because of fake news, fake reports, fake terror, and fake talk radio. We're the ones that bring you the truth. On the screen, you will see the graphics of the faces of the key players in the Kennedy assassination, including Rubenstein, who purportedly shot Lee Harvey Oswald, and then supposedly died in prison. But that, too, is very suspect, because uh, as Michael Collins Piper in his book shows, it is highly suspected that he did not die in prison, but actually was transferred back to Israel, where he assumed a whole new identity. So this goes very deep, ladies and gentlemen, too deep for the average person watching this program to even comprehend the extent of the evil which has taken over America, which the Bible clearly tells us, the evil of the sons of Cain and this war that continues to this very day. Right now, we will begin this program of my radio show interviewing Michael Collins Piper and the callers, and we will continue it. At the very end, you will see a fade out and the end of the program. So I want to thank you for joining in advance. Pay attention, learn something, and know the bad fig tree that Jesus denounced 
in the Gospels and in the Gospel of Matthew, 24 and 25, that would be the bellwether of the end of this earth and heaven age. Here we go. The Radio Adventure. Rick Adams is on. on. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages. Back again tonight on this Tuesday night edition of our program, Rick Adams Uncensored on Republic. And uh, I am very pleased to bring with us tonight on the program none other than Michael Collins Piper, who, uh, of course, uh, we uh, have uh, been accustomed to hearing on this network over a long period of time. And I'm glad to say that we are hearing his voice again tonight. And, uh, Mike, uh, gee whiz, it's been a while uh, that uh, we've been able to talk on air and uh, even in person. And um, I guess a good place to be would be your original book that you wrote in uh, 1994, uh, The Final Judgment. And um, for those new listeners who are just listening now, who never knew much about this book or, or about you, why don't you tell us, what was the uh, the main inspiration for you uh, in being intrigued enough to write this volume, this, uh, this great book that you've written on JFK and the assassination? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question because when I started writing the book or when I first, well, let's put it this way. <laughs> I'd always been interested in the Kennedy assassination. It was one of a sub-series of different subjects that I had a wide-ranging interest in and read a lot of books on the topic. I was interested in the sinking of the Titanic right? going back years and years ago, long before it became very popular. And I was interested in the JFK assassination, a few other, few other odds and ends of that nature over the years. And I had pretty much already concluded, going back to the time I was in junior high school, that the CIA had been involved in the Kennedy assassination with a little bit of assist from... Uh, elements in organized crime and uh, obviously involving, you know, anti-Castro Cubans. And that's a pretty standard assessment of the JFK assassination. And it's, a, it's, it's an assessment of the JFK assassination that has not considerably changed in my mind, even to this day, because uh, I think if you look at the record, it's very, very clear. Uh, Mark Lane in his book, Plausible Denial, and his, in his new book, I think it's called Last Word, not to be confused with Final Judgment, but Mark, uh, who is one of the pioneer JFK assassination researchers, he has, uh, he has put all a lot of his research together in this new book that just came out. And I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that the CIA, uh, elements in the CIA played a major part in the Kennedy assassination. And it's mm -hmm. kind of funny, as I noted in Final Judgment, uh, my mother had said to me one time many years ago, she said, why don't you write a book on the Kennedy assassination? And I said, well, there's no need to write a book on it because it's all, it's pretty much been told. <laughs> but, but certain things over the years I had read in a number of, of standard works on the JFK assassination had always nagged at me, but I didn't think too much about it until maybe the early 1990s, when uh, several books came out that for the first time explored JFK's, and I should say secret, relations with Israel. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason why I say they're secret, his secret relations with Israel, is because this information about it came out in three books that while some of them, you know, were, were reviewed and mentioned in the mass media, the details of the books largely remained hidden first book was a book by Jewish-American writer and Pulitzer Prize winner Seymour Hersh, The Samson Option. Right. It was a book about Israel's relationship uh, with the United States, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. A similar book was written by Andrew and Leslie Coburn, um, Dangerous Liaisons, uh, or maybe it's Dangerous Liaison, anyway, a, a book about U.S.-Israeli relations. And also Jewish-American writer uh, Stephen Green, uh, wrote a book, uh, and the title of that book escapes me at the moment. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Taking Sides, America's Secret Relations with a Militant Israel. And in that book, and also in the Coburn's book, the fact of JFK's very rocky relationship with the state of Israel 
over a number of policy issues, this, these, this data was explored. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had always been told that all oh, the Jews loved JFK and JFK was a loyal friend of Israel. And, you know, mm -hmm. there was, you know, there's nothing greater in JFK's foreign policy view than dear little Israel. Well, that mm -hmm. wasn't true. <laughs> and, in fact, as, as these three books very carefully document, and which subsequent books such as the Abner Cohen's book, Israel and the Bomb, have documented, uh, and, of course, it's, Abner Cohen is a Jewish person, from mm -hmm. Israel, so he can't very well be accused of being a neo-Nazi or an anti-Semite. Uh, these books all very forcefully and carefully documented beyond any question that John F. Kennedy was trying to stop Israel from building nuclear weapons. And as as we now know, thanks to this material and others that has been, other material that's since come out, President Kennedy considered the Israeli nuclear weapons program to be a top priority. This was not just some peripheral matter. This was a nuclear proliferation was a top priority, and Israeli nuclear proliferation was at the top of that particular priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Ethan Bronner, I believe it was, writing in the New York Times, uh, summarized it quite well when he said uh, in words to this effect, and the uh, this quotation appears in the final judgment. You can probably even find it on the Internet somewhere that that Abner Cohen's book pretty much makes it clear that had JFK lived, Israel would not have been able to achieve a nuclear arsenal. Okay, well, that's a pretty powerful thing, and a lot of my critics have said, oh, well, uh, there were many groups that were opposed to JFK, and there were many different people that, uh, that uh, JFK was at odds with. Uh, but Israel would never kill an American president because America is, was its, America is its greatest ally. And uh, one can only imagine what would happen, they always say, if word yeah. got out that Israel had been involved in a JFK assassination. Well, yeah, like the liberty. Yeah, like, right. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't even think of that analogy, you know, but yeah. that's perfect. Absolutely. We saw what we did in that case. We yeah, went to yeah. war. It, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, and, and yet, you know, now the problem Oh, I mean, we could go in a million different directions. Yeah. The, the bottom line of it is, the bottom line of it is, uh -huh. Israeli Prime Minister David Ben Gurion quit as Prime Minister precisely, not 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 for this only this reason, but but it was one of the reasons why he quit as Prime Minister in 1963 because he was fed up with John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. and he and he had written a letter, and this is in U.S. State Department files that have been published by the State Department. The Prime Minister of Israel wrote a letter to President Kennedy saying that Israel's very survival was in danger, and he makes it clear that that survival was in danger because he perceived President John F. Kennedy to not be sufficiently supportive of Israel's demands on the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, Jim Mars, who is hailed as one of the great JFK assassination researchers, in an appearance on the Alex Jones program a few years ago, said that one of the greatest motives for committing murder is survival. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the, and Jim Mars correctly, correctly noted that John F. Kennedy was moving against organized crime, and that organized crime consequently would have a reason to be involved in the Kennedy assassination. And he also pointed out, Mr. Mars did, that the CIA had a reason for its own survival and for that reason would want to move against JFK. But he did not mention that one country in the world that considered JFK a threat to its survival, and that was the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that is where final judgment comes in here because we provide the motive. The book provides the motive, but it also yeah. shows how key figures in organized crime, mm -hmm. popularly known as the mafia, but I don't like that terminology because it mm -hmm. makes everybody think that the Italian Americans were in charge of the crime syndicate when they yeah. weren't. We call it the uh, the uh, kosher nostra. The, the, the kosher nostra. That's <laughs> right. And also, if you look at the key figures in the CIA realm, yeah. who have been repeatedly implicated mm -hmm. in a JFK assassination, they are all people with intimate ties, not only to Israel and to the powerful Jewish lobby in America but to Israel's nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I'll give, I'll give three examples. Okay. We always hear about, Jan and now there's a, there's a number of, of, of uh, kind of independent-minded, liberal JFK assassination writers over the years 
who have, and I, I name them, I, and I mentioned these names before when I was on Deanna Spingola's program the other day here in Arby, yeah, I mentioned yeah. this. Uh, this guy, James D. Eugenio. Now, he and several people associated with him have written about James Angleton and the CIA, and mm-hmm. and other people have written about Angleton and the CIA, and there's no question that Angleton was involved in setting up Lee Harvey Oswald, that Angleton, who was the number three man in the CIA, had his eye on Oswald for years. Mm-hmm. And Angleton, as we all know, those of us who have studied the matter, Angleton was a key player in the cover-up. Angleton and this is the part they always seem to avoid mentioning, or they try to skirt around it and say it had nothing to do with the assassination or Angleton's motivations. Angleton was the, the head of the Mossad desk at the CIA, but he was more than that. He was a deeply devoted loyalist of Israel. Now, he wasn't Jewish. A lot of people have claimed over the years that he was Jewish. I've never seen any evidence of that, but it doesn't really matter one way or the other because the fact is he was a valued ally of Israel at the CIA. So mm-hmm. there is one of the, the probably the key high-level CIA figure who was involved in the Kennedy assassination. We often hear about uh, we often hear about uh, uh, David Atlee Phillips. Now, Mr. Yeah. Phillips is believed by many people to have possibly been Lee Harvey Oswald's handler or, or involved with him in some way. Uh, Mr. Phillips, after leaving the CIA, became a key figure in a company that was involved in arms deals connected to Israel. Now, that's, mm-hmm. that's just kind of a minor minor yeah. point right there, but, but it's another one of these things that people forget about. Mm-hmm. More importantly, we've all heard the name Frank Sturgis, who's often been believed by many people. I don't personally believe him to have been one of the three tramps in Dallas, but I do believe that he was in Dallas. I've seen documentary evidence indicating that in his own handwriting, uh, Frank Sturgis said that he was working for James Angleton when he was in Dallas Mm -hmm. at the time of the Kennedy assassination. And there have been many, many people who have looked into Sturgis and firmly believe that he was involved in the assassination, not as a gunman, but as a coordinator. We'll get more to that when we come back. Yes, all right. It's getting interesting, and as you said, there are so many directions to go in. But we'll try to cover some of the bases tonight. Folks, our guest is Michael Collins Piper, The Final Judgment, and much more. All right, hey, we're back now with Mike Piper and talking about the JFK assassination. Well, Mike, you uh, you brought up some of the names, of course, in your book, and some of those names that, as you have said, have never been quite brought up in the context of the Israeli connection, interestingly enough. And, you know, I was saying the other night how it it really goes from the sublime to the ridiculous, you know, in terms (laughs) of theories and all sorts of, uh, you know, constructs in America today from those who say they still believe, uh, and the computers will prove it, in the single gunman, the single bullet theory, blah, 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 to those who believe in a conspiracy. But like all other intrigues, assassinations, wars, and murders in the last century or so, it's interesting how this media will always be willing to entertain the idea of a conspiracy possibly from within our government, but never, never a conspiracy that would involve the poor little innocent, defenseless, tiny state of Israel. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know, that's funny, Rick, because, you know, I obviously, in the, in the context of the book, I address this. And in, in Final Judgment, I have a chart. I have several charts what I, that I put forth to try to illustrate yeah, right. my point. And one of them is a simple box in which other boxes all fit together very neatly in that same box. Uh And the smaller boxes say CIA, mafia, organized crime, FBI, Mm -hmm. Secret Service, et cetera, et cetera. But Mm -hmm. the point is the big box into which they all fit (laughs) carefully together is what I call the Mossad box. Yes. And, And then I have another chart which shows all of the connections of all of these key players, individual players and and intelligence organizations and entities. And in that chart, I show how even to the extent that there is any acknowledgement of a possible conspiracy in the JFK assassination, the part that they keep covered up in the mainstream media, and unfortunately a lot of independent, quote-unquote, independent journalists and patriot writers as well, 
They mm-hmm. just choose to look the other way when we start knocking, as I put it, uh, Peter Dale Scott, who's one of the big researchers in the JFK assassination, mm-hmm. he'll walk up to the door that says Mossad and stare at it, but he won't <laughs> knock on that door. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. There's quite a few of them, right. You know, and, and, you know, let me tell you a story here, and it actually happened on this network back when Kevin Barrett was a, uh, mm-hmm. a broadcaster here. He was interviewing Peter Dale Scott, who has written multiple books on the Kennedy assassination, and, and among liberal researchers, He's hailed as kind of like the godfather of JFK assassination research. And in his books, and in one book in particular, Deep Politics, which is kind of like a Bible to many of the liberal JFK assassination researchers, (laughs) Dr. Scott wrote repeatedly about a very interesting character here in Washington, an old Jewish arms dealer named I. Irving Davidson, who was a good friend of Jimmy Hoffa. He was indicted alongside Carlos Marcello in the Brylab case uh, that finally sent the old mafia boss of New Orleans to jail. Uh, he was a friend of Nixon, uh, an associate of Jack Anderson and Drew Pearson. Uh, he knew everybody. He was uh, tied up with the CIA. He's the arms dealer who introduced the Israeli Uzi here into the United States. He was a lobbyist for the Israeli aircraft industry. Very well-connected guy. And repeatedly over the years, Peter Dale Scott wrote that he figured that if there was anybody who was involved in the JFK assassination or had some role or inside knowledge of it, he said it had to be I. Irving Davidson. Well, this struck me as very, very interesting because... uh, uh, Mr. Scott was be Dr. Scott was being interviewed by Kevin Barrett, and I I called up RBN. I didn't identify myself. I don't think even the RBN uh, uh, a board operator knew who I was. I just said I was Mike, and I told Dr. Scott right there in the air that I really admired his work, which I do, and I mentioned to him on the air that uh, I had noted that he had written quite a bit about this guy I Irving Davidson. Well, uh, let me just tell you the story directly here. I knew I. Irving Davidson. He's a very, very old man now. He's uh, born in 1920. He's in uh, very frail health, but he was an old reader of our newspaper, The Spotlight. He used to stop in The Spotlight office. And he's a very interesting character, and uh, we hit it off, and we used to have lunch all the time. And I gave him a copy of my book, Final Judgment, which, of course, mentioned many, many people and agencies that he was associated with. And he told me one day I was standing right in his office down at the old Commerce Building here in Washington, D.C. He said, you know, he said, I read your book, Final Judgment. And he said, I think that's pretty much what happened. Well, I told, <laughs> I told, I called the program there where, where Peter Dale Scott was being interviewed, and I told him, I said, you know, uh, I've read about Irving Davidson, and he told me one time that he thinks Michael Collins Piper's book, Final Judgment, is pretty much what happened. And old Dr. Scott said, oh, my word, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is interesting because Peter Dale Scott, to, to information that's been brought to me, has repeatedly attacked me and my book. But here live on the air, he was told that uh, – the guy who he has repeatedly implicated in a JFK assassination felt that Mike Piper's book was the book which told pretty much what happened. Uh-huh. Well, then yeah. I told Dr. Scott who I was and kind of surprised. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think we uh, did an interview or tried to do an interview with uh, Dale, as a matter of fact, on one of the subjects pertaining to 9-11. Then, uh, and that was a long time ago. Never heard from him since. Okay, let's take that break, Mike. We'll come right back with Michael Collins Piper. Well, isn't it ironic, Mike, that uh, in light of what they pulled on 9-11, the fact that the same shadowy figures, the same lineage, the same line of criminals and gangsters had uh, a major role in uh, pulling and then covering up 9-11 and the road to war, war by deception, should in fact give us an opportunity to show credence to your work and the work of others. Rick, you know, it's very, very interesting because I'll tell you something. I personally believe, you know, without we could get into all the forensics and all the details of both both the JFK assassination and 9-11, but I personally believe that the same template Uh was used in 
the JFK assassination that ultimately evolved in 9-11. Now, 9-11, we all recall, there were a lot of, uh, uh, of phony uh, terror alerts being conducted. You know, these exercises being conducted mm-hmm. that caused a lot of distraction, you know, within the... Uh, Within the within the uh, 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 the air traffic controllers and in the Pentagon, you know where where the, I forget the name the uh, uh, the programs that were being carried out, but then then the then the nine eleven attacks took place. Well, you know what I believe happened with the JFK assassination is that there were elements, possibly even connected to Bobby Kennedy and even Jack Kennedy, who were going to stage or who were talking about staging a phony attempt on the life of President Kennedy that mm-hmm. could be linked back to Fidel Castro mm-hmm. and that there would be shots fired in Dealey Plaza, et cetera, et cetera, but not really at the president, mm-hmm. but that, in fact, then the real conspirators, the real plotters, and I believe in this case the Mossad and their, their, their henchmen you know, in, in organized crime and people in the CIA who were playing along with the game, that they actually carried out a real assassination. And there's a lot, if you look in, it's very disparate in a lot of different sources. You will find there are, there is talk, there are allusions to a possible dummy assassination attempt that was actually co-opted on November 22nd, 1963. And personally, if you want to take it even further, I think that's kind of what happened uh, down there in Oklahoma City. I think Timothy McVeigh, and without going into the details here, and I don't want to get sidetracked into the Oklahoma bombing, well, it's all right but, because there but, is a common thread here. Yeah, what I what I what I generally feel what happened there was that that McVeigh was manipulated, perhaps into if indeed he did, but it, it appears that he did driving a truck up to the Murrah building, which may may or may not have had a bomb in, or probably did have a small bomb in, and that McVeigh thought they were going to blow up a truck. But, in fact, inside the building, as we all know, there were explosives that actually brought the building down. So, again, it's that same template, you know, where where one thing appears to be happening, but, in fact, something else takes place, you know, something much bigger. So, you know, that's pure, that's pure speculation. But, as I say, when you get into the, the connections of people linked to the assassination, I mean, I, I cannot resist, and I have to bring up Clay Shaw of New Orleans. Now, of course... Arnon Milshan, the Israeli arms dealer, financed Oliver Stone's film JFK. Mm-hmm. Oliver Stone, uh, uh, I think, being a sincere truth seeker, uh, a, a bit of a bit erratic, I suppose. But but Arnon Milshan is a key player in Israel's nuclear weapons program. Now, here's the guy who makes this movie, which basically suggests to the American people that Lyndon Johnson. And a couple angry American generals carried off the JFK assassination, uh, manipulating people like Clay Shaw and ultimately Lee Harvey Oswald. But, you know, Clay Shaw, Clay Shaw was linked to Israel's nuclear weapons program through two different ways. Number one, through his infamous service on the board of this company called Permandex. Now, all the liberal JFK assassination researchers say, well, that's proof of the CIA connection, but they ignore the fact that Louis Bloomfield, the chairman of the Permandex Corporation, was a key player, one of the financiers behind Israel's nuclear weapons program, number one. Number two, he was directly connected to the Bronfman family of Canada, mm-hmm. leader of the World Jewish Congress, and also key players, financial backers of Israel's nuclear weapons program. And when Clay Shaw was on trial in New Orleans, uh, the Stern family were financing his defense. The Stern family were stockholders in the New Mech nuclear plant in Apollo, Pennsylvania, which has been linked indubitably, unquestionably, to the illicit transfer of U.S. uh, nuclear materiel to Israel's arms program. 